James Hawkinson, congratulations on receiving your very first Emmy nomination for your work on The Man in the High Castle. How did it feel getting the news you'd been nominated? Uh, it's very exciting. I was, uh, I'm thrilled, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, you had gotten an ASC nomination for this uh, last year, so did you anticipate that you, you might be in the running or at all? Or? Um, well, I, I definitely know that the show um, is a high-profile show, and it's got a lot of, um, you know, uh, attention and recognition um, for my work and, you know, for a lot of people that worked on the show. So, uh, uh, but of course, it was a surprise because, you know, there are so many, uh, I, I think there was a record amount of entries this year. So, um, it was a surprise. Yeah, something like close to 400 shows, I think, were in the running. So. Uh, congratulations for making the cut. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with this show. I was uh, I was doing a, a, a series called Hannibal um, that was aired on NBC, and uh, on uh, season two we had a guest director by the name of David Semmel who ended up doing uh, the pilot for for this show. So um, I he approached me about collaborating with him on this pilot and uh and i was thrilled um of course uh i'm a philip k dick fan and uh a ridley scott fan and of course uh i love blade runner and um so it was it was an exciting project from the start mm -hmm. and now you're nominated for your work on the pilot and uh of course in a pilot you're supposed to establish the mood and, and tone of the show and what the overall look is going to be. So what were your initial ideas for what that look was? Well, we wanted a um, somewhat of a retro futuristic look for the show. And what I mean by that is uh, retro in terms of we wanted it to um, have a vintage look, a look of uh, kind of how uh, photography and film looks in the early 60s. And futuristic in that there's impossible technology that takes place within the show. But basically, we wanted a very uh, nostalgic, um, again, early 60s type of uh, palette. Mm -hmm. And how did you go about achieving that uh, through color and, and framing and, and light? Well, uh, rather than do it, um, Photochemically, you know, with with you know real film stocks and and using stocks that they had of the period, uh, we did it all uh, digitally, basically. So it's it's really it really comes down to you know the grading of it uh, to give it to give it that that type of look. But but also with our choice of lenses and filtrations and and, and things like that, uh, just in capturing it in the first place, um, those were considerations. Mm -hmm. And then in working with uh, the other department heads, uh, I mean, you're one of four total nominations that the show received. It's also up for production design and visual effects. And I mean, that plays a, a great deal in, uh, in how you go about doing your work. Can you talk about collaborating with the other department heads on this? Yeah, absolutely. There was. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussions with um, with Drew, our production designer, and with Audrey, our costume designer, about the the kind of color palettes that we wanted to have in front of the camera. And um, um, so there was a lot of discussion about each specific color. And um, and again, what would give this kind of you know vintage. Uh, look to it. There are certain colors that feel more nostalgic than others. Mm -hmm. um, so you've worked on a lot of really high-end projects, Hannibal being one of them, and of course this one as well. Uh, you know, the work in television is becoming more and more cinematic every day. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's a it's a it's a revolution that's happening. Um, uh, I I don't know if it's a generational thing or or what it is, but but certainly there's a lot of 
a great uh, craftsmen, craftspeople, you know, out there, out there doing, doing this stuff. And, and, and I'm pleased to be part of that revolution. Um, I've always tried to uh, make my shows look different and, you know, from, from the comedies I did to, to this one. And um, anyway, it's, it's, it's gratifying to be part of this movement. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there is a lot of crossover with, with TV people going to do movies and, and movie people going to do TV. I mean, the lines just sort of blur a lot. This project in particular is something that 20 years ago or so would be a film. But instead, you, you have season after season that you can develop this long form story. Um, how did your work develop over the course of shooting the season? You, you shot a lot of episodes for this. Yeah. Well, it's funny, Rid Ridley Scott originally was going to do this mm. um, as a film, and I had heard um, that he um, brought Philip K. Dick down to show him the opening of Blade Runner, those you know magnificent first shots, uh, you know, showing the uh, cityscape of Los Angeles. Um, it was actually those shots were actually done by a guy named Dave Stewart. I used to uh, used to light for him uh, back when I was uh, working in visual effects. But anyway, um, so the the project developed. I, I think it had many incar incarnations. Was that the word? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then became a television series. So uh, I, I I feel like when you go to to series with things, you know, things can kind of ebb and flow a little bit. And there are there are certain things that aesthetically we kind of adhere to on the show, and and one of those is that. San Francisco tends to look a little warmer and New York looks a little colder. And the, the way that that happened was actually a happy accident when I did the pilot. Um, when I did that, um, that very large establishing shot of San Francisco uh, at sunset, the light had a very warm and brassy quality to it. I found out later that this was due to forest fires in Siberia. Mm. And that the sun was going through that atmosphere and just giving a very warm palette to it. Now that doesn't mean that in going to series, every shot of San Francisco will necessarily be warmer. But um, but again, these these kind of aesthetics can sort of ebb and flow as you move along. Mm -hmm. Real quick, do you have a light that you can switch on nearby? You just you keep going a little dark every so often. Um, Is that better? Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's like a shadow that keeps coming over you every so often. I'm not sure if it's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure the people will be able to see you. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, that's yeah, that's better. Okay. Probably just brighten it a little bit when I uh, <clears throat> anyway. Um uh where were we? What were we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, well we're just kinda of talking about, you know, going you know, going from you know, from the pilot to series, from from a feature approach to a television approach. Um, right, right, right. Kind of talking about the aesthetics and Right, right, right. Um give me a second, I just uh lost my place. Um in working with David Simmel on the pilot, what did he give you? You two had worked together already on Hannibal. So what is that collaboration like between the two of you? And then bringing in the showrunner um, to kind of guide the way as well. Well, uh, we, we had a working relationship, having, having worked together before. And, uh, you know, so there's a familiarity there. But, but certainly this, this is a, this, this was a new project and, um, and we really, you know, started from scratch, from you know, from from ground zero to to start, you know, building up, building up, um, you know, how we were going to approach this one because certainly it's a it's a different 
it's a different show than, than Hannibal, the one we had worked on before. Um, so it's really, uh, again, we, we, we started at ground zero, you know, just uh, with the other department heads, et cetera, you know, world building, they call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys really do, all of you, create this uh, world that it's a tough thing to do because it has to be a world that's recognizable, but also uh, very much different, you know, an alternative history of our, of our uh, country, you know. Yeah, again, it's sort of, uh, you know, we really wanted the effect of, you know, you're looking at old family photographs from the early 60s and old Kodachrome photographs from something, but... There's a rocket ship flying through the background, or you know, just something, something inexplicable, uh, you know, technology-wise. I mean, Philip K. Dick was very interested in in false worlds, you know, mm -hmm. false people, uh, you know, false. He he was, I think, he was the ultimate skeptic when it came to reality, um, and so. Um, we kind of wanted to play with that, you know, again, you know, bringing something that is very familiar, nostalgic, yet completely foreign and strange. Mm -hmm. So the what for you would be a, an individual shock from this pilot that you would point to and say, that's an example of the best that I was able to achieve, either because it looked really good or uh, it conveyed a certain amount of information very well. What would be a shot that you would point to and say, I really hit it out of the park with that one? Well, I, I, think, I think both of the establishing shots of San Francisco and New York City are, are, are worth mention. And, um, you know, the, the, beginning of, the beginning of our show, we don't really know what's going on. We're in a movie theater. Um, our, our protagonist is, is, is past a, a piece of paper with an address, the name of a trunking company on it, and then he begins this journey. And it's a little bit strange in the movie theater. There's a couple of small hints. There might be a, a flag with a swastika on it or you know, some little hint. And as he walks through the lobby, there's kind of suspicious looking people looking over their shoulders. But when he exits that movie theater and he's, he's walking through Times Square on his way to, to, uh, to the subway, that's when we really go big and, and open up what this world is that we're creating here. And, um, you know, as soon as we're, you know, we, I think we go through a, um, a uh, newspaper stand that has like Adolf Hitler as Time Magazine's Man of the Year on the cover, and that's that's a very subtle thing. And then as you arrive into the center of Times Square, you see this massive neon uh, swastika and all these propaganda poster, posters, you know, industry surge and all this kind of stuff. So that that shot definitely comes to mind. Mm -hmm. It really is striking. Um, what was it that got you into doing this? I mean, what, what was it that, uh, had you always wanted to be a cinematographer or was it something that just developed from a love of movies? That's a great question. Uh, and one that not a lot of people ask. Uh, it's, it's a combination of things. Um, my parents were, were huge uh, movie fans and, you know, I, I grew up watching, you know, films and, uh, uh, television shows, etc., um, and uh, I. But but when I was a teenager, I was more into music, and I, I played piano and um, different keyboards and so forth. And I I thought about uh, becoming a composer for films. And uh, oh, wow. by the time I got to college, I started experimenting with film just to kind of cut to my own music and completely fell in love with the craft. Mm -hmm. Well, James, once again, congratulations on your work, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Zach. Welcome. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.